Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Um, we're going to use a bit of amplification just so that we can ask questions. And if you want to ask questions, you can. Um, I can move amongst you uh, with the uh, magical microphone. Uh, welcome to St. Margaret's. In the absence of anybody formal from the ROBA, the chair falls to me. So it feels a bit strange to be sitting here <laughs> rather than standing, as I do normally stand up. But anyway, welcome. It's lovely to see so many, many of you here. Uh, just to hear a bit about what we've been up to, what Darren's been uh, doing with us and, and, and for us. So we're going to, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my kind of um, experience from a client's perspective um, and, and the kind of journey, that we've, it's all about journey, isn't it, the journey that we've been on. Um, it's been, you know, spoiler alert, it, it's been fabulous, you know. If you want to hear a really good news story, you know, you're in the right place because it's been brilliant. Uh, we've really enjoyed working with Darren. We've really enjoyed that Darren and Roger and, and his, his collaborators have caught the vision that we've got. Uh, you know, this is a church uh, and, and we're not shy about that. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So I'm going to talk to you a, bit, a little bit about that. Um, and then Darren's going to run through the, his three minute presentation, which took 10 minutes, uh, but did bag in the uh, AJ uh, Small Projects Award, which again, is extraordinary uh, and thoroughly well deserved and we're so pleased for that because we know how much that means in this particular environment it's uh, you know people work their entire careers don't they and never come anywhere near that list uh, and there you go uh, but i don't want any of those kind of awards or anything like that to detract from the vision and that really is where we enjoyed working with Darren and Roger and, and, and the others of, of his studio so much because they understood that vision, they got that vision. Uh, and then, when we've done that, um, there is the elephant in the room here, of course, so if you want to take your shoes off, you can have a go on that. <laughs> He's not joking. I'm not joking, no, no, I'm totally not joking. Um, you know, at your own risk, obviously, et cetera, et cetera. It's fully tested and all that, um, and I'll tell you a bit more about it in a minute. Uh, I've, three pound first and Paul says, Paul is our treasurer who's going to drive the, the PA. Um, but, uh, yeah, we've, we, be between us, we've moved that thing around this building um, three times, I think. And it's very, very heavy. Anyway, and then we can have a look around. So we have a good look around. Uh, you can go anywhere you like. Um, there's, there's the uh, kind of chapel over there, which is like a kind of one-to-one -one model of what we wanted to do. Uh, Darren will talk about, a bit about that. There's the community shop here. There's the cafe in the corner. Um, there's a stock room at the top with a rather beautiful 1950s staircase which uh, Hugh Pierman was very taken with when he came down here wasn't he? He was really like that. Uh, there's the food bank come Lala in the corner, there's a play area, there's a bicycle recycling, motivate people there, and the offices at the back and uh, if anybody needs the loo there's some at the back. Um, beautifully designed, a lovely learned colleague here. Um, and that's it. And then we just ask, ask any questions. If you want to ask any questions, we've got a microphone so everybody can hear the question. Um, probably once before we do the tour, uh, you know, feel free and um, yeah, ask anything you like. So I've got my little notes here, <laughs> so I shall go through them. Um, church is a verb, not a noun to us. Church isn't the building, it's what we do. It's not somewhere that you go. Okay, so keep that in mind when you're around here. Um, I think perhaps what I want you to tread on your, your highly educated toes, architecture perhaps is a verb, not a noun, is it not? Um, discuss. Perhaps that's another, um, perhaps that's another uh, meeting. The other thing that we say is between the management, so Fran you've seen, he's got, it's actually Fran's 25th wedding anniversary today, so he said, oh, mate, do you mind if you do this bit? I said, do I mind? <laughs> <You know. laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> so he's disappeared off. But we have this thing that we say, uh, keep the thing the thing. So no matter how gorgeous and lovely and beautiful this concrete floor is, and it is, it's here to support the people who come in the building. So the thing is the thing. And the thing for us is, the primary purpose of this is to be a place where we can share our love for Jesus. We're all Christians and we make no bones about that uh, in this community. Um, and this community really needed a church. It just didn't know that it needed a church. Um, this building uh, has been here since, what, 1905, something like that. It's got a 1950s bit on the back. You'll know more about this uh, than me. Uh, and in the cupboard, there's lovely cupboards that Sam was admiring, uh, there is uh, it's called a schedule of services, so we have to record every service that we do. Uh, who's officiating, to use the Anglican language, how many people turn up, how many people take communion, that sort of stuff. And you look at the beginning of that and there's this beautiful copper plate writing and the numbers get smaller and smaller and smaller. And that is so sad. 
uh, until it got to about 10 with a very elderly vicar uh, and a great big building that was falling apart around his ears and with 12 little old ladies in it. Uh, and they were little old ladies. The diocese found that it was untenable, so the church was closed. So you've got this great big building on a pretty nice site. You know, it's quite a nice part of Pompey. Um, yeah, it is, I promise you. Uh, do you sell it, take a capital receipt, build a block of flats? It's gone. The diocese, to their great credit, didn't do that. They, uh, those of you who know South Sea, what's off the No St. Jude's, which is about a mile or so in that direction, it's got the big spiky uh, spire. Um, St. Jude's took the pastoral responsibility for this diocese on. So if people wanted to get married or a funeral or anything like that, then the pastoral, technical Church of England responsibility was taken on by the, the Vicar of St. Jude's. Uh, and then about 12, I think, of us, 12 or 15 of us were, it's called planted. This is what the early church would do. They would take a group of believers and they say, right, go into that place where there is no church and be a church. So they planted us, and we started off with that rather nasty 1980s book. I oh, know it's nasty over there. Um, and there was about 15 of us, and then there was a, a few of us, and then one Christmas, there were far too many people to fit in the building. And Darren got involved, and, and anyway, that's, that's, that's the story that all developed. So the light bulb moment that we had was the meanwhile, the word meanwhile. Because often you'll see thermometers outside a church. We need five million pounds to repair this church. Well, good luck with that, because you've got 12 people and they're all pensioners and you're never going to get five million quid, forget it. Um, you could spend five million pounds on this building and you'd never know we'd been here. We spent 350,000 pounds on it and everybody knows that he's been here. So the meanwhile things, we can start with a vision, clear ideas of things that we want to do, um, and we can just do things meanwhile, and whilst we're waiting to. I'm not trying to say Darren, but anyway, interrupt me if you want to, but I've got the microphone. Oh, you've got a microphone <laughs> as well. That really struck, it was, we were sitting in, the, in one of the rooms back there on the floor, as, as you know, architects and clients tend to do, with great big drawings all around the place. And we just sort of thought, yeah, actually, we can just start doing things. We can stop the building leaking. Then we can get in, we can start doing our men's fitness thing here, or maybe we can, we can have a party in here. And then we can fix the electric so you actually can see what you're doing. Then we take all the pews out, because those are awful. We can sell them, because they're worth money. Um, and then we can get rid of all the kind of the rather old-fashioned church furniture, as, a, as people would call it, and things like that are difficult to remove. But yeah, I'd say watch this space, but don't watch that space, particularly those things. Yeah, they're, they're next on the list. Um, and we were able to do things that met with the vision as it developed. And Roger and Darren, and were, they came to the services, they observed what we did, they saw the shop in action and worked out how we could make it work. So, you know, for the architects present, that's a real lesson, I think, to, to engage with the clients. This isn't a product, this is something that delivers a service, you know, with a small, and I, I intended the pun, so feel free to laugh, or maybe not. <laughs> Thank you, Darren. You'll pay your bill now. Um, so some of the radical things that Darren and Roger suggested we might do, actually, we've been doing for years, winter beds, for instance, taking people off the streets, giving them a bed for the night, feeding them, we just do that stuff. Taking the church outside, well, we do that anyway. Uh, and some of the things that they suggested, which had not come across our radar at all, like this floor. Let's take up this beautiful parquet floor and put concrete in, in its place, and we'll, we'll make it into a massive storage heater. Uh-huh, okay, let's go and look at some stuff, says Darren in London. Yeah, let's do that. Oh, wow, it's the most beautiful thing in the world ever. And isn't it? I mean, isn't it? <laughs> it's absolutely lovely, and it's so hard-wearing. Um, so this is a material that any church that I refurbish with Darren, we're going to have again. So as the project uh, developed, the vision developed, but we always kept the thing the thing. We always kept in mind against the vision of a church and sharing you know, our collective love for Jesus, for the people around here. And that means all the people. It doesn't just mean people who are Christians, doctors. You know, you don't, if you're well, you don't need a doctor. It's for the people who walk off the street. You probably will tonight, who have not got anything at all. So I could tell you many stories, and I won't do that necessarily, but I'll, I'll just give you, I'll give you one little story, because it really does play into the, into the vision and how this works. So there's a group of young people, there's two adult women and three children, who refused to deny their Christian faith in a Middle Eastern country, and were going to be killed. So they came through that door there with only the clothes they had on their back. Um, and through the people who use this building, and the volunteers, some of whom have a faith, some of whom don't, they now have their children in school, they, are, they have places to live, 
the connections with the with the city council and all those sort of all those sorts of things, they all operate around this fulcrum. So you keep the thing the thing. And two of those women were baptized on Easter Sunday and it was one of the most extraordinary things I've experienced in a pool in the middle of this room here. Um, and it made me think, from a Christian perspective, clearly there's a layer of thinking that, you know, if you don't have a faith you wouldn't share. But it made me think how lucky we are in this country and how how much we must value our freedom to express any faith or no faith without fear of being taken away and disappearing. Absolutely beautiful. That wouldn't have happened without this collaborative approach. Um, a local family who, um, a family of five, three small children and two adults, who ordered twice the amount of groceries for two years so that they could support the food bank. Sorry, I keep pointing at you, my friend, because it's in that corner over there. It's not at the moment, it's outside. Um, and when the, uh, when the delivery driver they said, well, why, how much do you eat in this house? I said, well, we only eat the normal amount, but half of it goes to the food bank in St. Margaret's. And he broke down. And how about a community that opens its doors and its arms as wide as possible, but always keeps the thing the thing? That's what this piece of architecture has allowed us to do. So we had in here, uh, what you might remember in September, I think last year, there was that brief period of time when the shackles were removed from us and we were allowed to meet. So the wonderful people who run Motivate in there, along with um, the incredible Sharla, uh, who does the uh, Grateful Arts Club, follow them on Instagram, they're absolutely amazing people, had a community arts exhibition in here, which had 600 people over about four hours. It was untrammeled joy. Everybody just thought, we can meet, we can see each other. There was, a, what, what did we have? We had bagels, we had street dance, we had face painting, we had that, obviously. We had all the amazing art by some of the, the, the city's kind of leading artists who contributed all this stuff for free, which is then sold, all of it sold. Uh, to support the bicycle recycling workshop. Did I mention there's a bicycle recycling workshop in the corner of the church? I didn't, did I? Um, we had um, just a little corner for reflection, just up at the top of the church there. Um, so opening our arms as wide as possible, the building allows us to do that, but keeping the thing the thing. So, some numbers, um, and I'll keep this quick. Numbers are great, aren't they? We love numbers, don't we? I love a number, I love a list. My children laugh at me because I just love lists of things, like, you know, when certain cameras were manufactured, that kind of thing. Um, but numbers on their own don't tell the story. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of scripture. You're not in a church after all, you wouldn't think I'd pass up that opportunity, that perhaps illustrates why some of the numbers are meaningful and why we think they're meaningful. So the food bank, an everyday miracle. So here's a little passage from Matthew's Gospel. You might recognize it. Jesus said, bring them here. And he had the people sit on the grass. He took the five loaves and two fish, lifted his face to heaven in prayer, blessed, broke, and gave the bread to the disciples. The disciples gave the food to the congregation. They all ate their fill. They gathered 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 were fed. So we start off with five shelves in the corner there in this horrible, grotty old building. And we ended up, once the pandemic hit, feeding around 100 people a week, all through lockdown, every week, about 10,000 people, people in total. And we've worked through that process. We've worked in collaboration with you trust to give our clients, uh, I don't want to call them clients, but uh, advice uh, regards with benefits, switched on Portsmouth, which is part of the city council who I work for. Uh, the, the energy team have been here to advise people on their energy bills, and boy, do we all need that advice now. Um, and we provide pastoral support to uh, the regular people that come through. So. It's not just a food bank, it's an everyday miracle. The people get connections and they come and they work. Donations from the community was in excess of £60,000. Paul, you might be able to tell me exactly how much, but maybe later, Paul's our treasurer. Uh, and donations have fluctuated, obviously, as people, have, the needs has fluctuated, but we've never run out. And that is where that little bit of scripture comes, we've never run out. And we've always had what we've needed, and that is beautiful. So now we're moving from the food bank to the pantry model. So the food bank, this was, there's two non-referral food banks. So if you need to go to a food bank, normally you have to go through a whole load of really complicated referral processes, you, you may know, uh, in order to get, to get your ticket. And then you go to this place, if you can bear to go through that process. Um, you know, I work for a local authority. I like process, uh, but it, it horrifies me. This is a non-referral food bank, so no judgment, no nothing. You just walk in, you say what you need, and you take it away. So we gave... We had individuals, small families and large families, 
and uh, we would just uh, hand the stuff out, but we never ran out, we never ran out. So now we're moving to a pantry model, so you can have a poke, poke your head there and have a look. So what that is, it, there's a very small charge, but the idea being that it's a supplement rather than all that is necessary. We still do the food bank, but we're moving towards the pantry to try and help people just to build the confidence up, and some people struggle a little bit with the dignity of asking for charity. Um, but goodness me, the, the amount that it was used, and this is a fairly middle class part of Port, Portsmouth, really. It was, it was, it was uh, very chastening. So, soft play in a church, you want to do what? Anyway, some more scripture for you. One day, children were brought to Jesus in the hope that he would lay hands on them and pray over them. The disciples shooed them off. I'm using a modern version of it, but I like that. He shooed them off, but Jesus intervened. Let the children alone, leave them alone. Don't prevent them from coming to me. God's kingdom is made up of people like these. And after laying hands on them, he left. 14, 50 children a week use this, uh, and that's just in the week, not the children that come to the church. It's a safe place, it's cheap, uh, it costs you 15 quid to go to Crazy Caves or something like that, a few pounds, you know, or nothing. There's coffee, there's, there's people around to help. It's a safe place, people can spend all day here. So that's why we did that, and we had to move it around. So the last one is the coffee, uh, is the cafe and, and the shop, so the cafe and the shop. And then I'll shut up and let the architect do some talking. So a little bit more scripture. This is from Acts, so this is the first, this is like the history of the early church. Uh, it's fantastic, it's really exciting. Everyone around was in awe, all those wonders and signs done through the apostles. And all the believers lived in wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. So the community shop reopened after the main part of the COVID pandemic, having run briefly beforehand, on um, the 15th of April last year. It's open Thursdays and Fridays, 10 till 2 about 110 visitors a week, so 50 odd people a day. That's, again, extraordinary. I could fill the rest of your evening with stories about how the donations have blessed people. Oh well, you can imagine it. Um, but we have a thriving volunteer base, over 50 people drawn from the people who came initially to the food bank or came to, because they were lonely, to the cafe or to use the use the shop, they now work here. They've now found dignity and purpose, and that is brilliant. Uh, and they're not all Christians. They're just people from the local community, people who live next door. Um, but we've also been able to support other local charities, schools, individuals. Um, so, for instance, uh, Baby Basics, Portsmouth Libraries, Lifehouse, St. Jude's Church, our mother church, if you will, Homeless Day Services, Lamport Wilder, Cumberland Infant School, just around the corner, the Moving On Project, Portsmouth, and local refugees, and of course, the. the the war that's going on at the moment in, in Ukraine. So some numbers, a bit of scripture, I've over lengthened what I was planning to say, but I love this place. I love what we've been able to do through <coughs> this brilliant piece of architecture. Um, so on that note, I'll hand, well, you've got your own microphone. I'll switch my mic off and let Darren tell you about the building itself, the technical stuff. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so what I'm gonna attempt to do is what I should have done three weeks ago when we presented at the Architects Journal Small Projects Award. We were supposed to be given three minutes with six slides, uh, and I think I took um, six minutes um, with all the judges staring at me going, what are you going to do now? Now the buzzer's gone, are you actually going to stop or carry on? So I'm going to talk for a maximum of ten minutes, and then we can have a wander around, have a chat, questions, and then we, and then we can go and have a, a, a beer around the corner. Um, so. Basically, um, three and a half, four years ago, um, I made the foolish decision to set up my own practice. Having been in private practice in Hampshire for 20, 25 years ago, I studied here at the University of Portsmouth. Um, I met a chap who many of you know here called Roger Tyrrell, who gave me my first job, age 16, so that's 35 years ago. Um, and so Roger and I then came back together um, when we were invited by Andrew. So um, Andrew and I have a, <coughs> a relationship through uh, the University of Portsmouth, through teaching here, and effectively Andrew invited us to come and have a conversation um, with the community and the team here. Uh, we, were ex we were totally and utterly overwhelmed by the fact that we were invited to come and have a conversation um, because we'd literally just set up the practice. 
Um, but as I said to somebody here this evening, when Norman Foster won the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, he was the only person in the room that had never done a bank. So we'd never done a church, so therefore we felt that you know, we, we, we could bring some passion, some energy, um, and, and a lot of research. So apologies, you probably can't read all the, all the text on, um, on, on these slides. But effectively, those images on this first slide, what we're calling our sort of act one, um, it's all about community engagement. So day one, when we were invited to come and meet everybody uh, in, the, in the church hall next door, um, everybody said, so what's your vision? And we said, we don't know what our vision is. You've got, you've got to work with us. We've got to work with you to kind of understand what that vision is and how we're going to use this building. The archdeacon had condemned this building uh, because of the roof. Um, so it was, it was our job to kind of come and get involved with community engagement. So Andrew, Fran, Stephen and the team then set about to organise um, some community engagement an hour before one of the Sunday services. Roger and I then uh, came up with a series of little tasks and events. Uh, we had um, everybody from the local community, not everybody that was just attending the church here, so uh, the chap right in the centre with a hat on is Stephen Morgan, the first ever Labour MP here in the city who came along with many of the... Oh, look at that. Fantastic, Paul. <laughs> um, many of the uh, local councillors, Labour and Lib Dems, who've been massive supporters of, of this project. So we set about kind of collating the kind of community engagement. What was the... What's the future of church? Well, actually, the future of church, Andrew's described much of it, and it's not just about you know, what happens on a Sunday. It's about inviting the community in. It's about cafe, it's about shop, it's about food bank, it's about play. And it's about intergenerational um, experience. Um, so if we can flick onto the next slide, please, Paul. So once we'd done the community engagement, we then set about um, undertaking um, a feasibility study. And for us, that was all about um, permeability. It was about crossing that threshold. I look out of um, the door now, and it feels that you know, we have begun to achieve something which makes people feel that this is a building to be welcomed in. We all know those buildings that we've been to where the threshold, um, most of us that are architects, it's normally the RBA at Portland Place. It looks very um, sort of austere, not particularly welcoming. And for us, it was about how do we make people feel welcome? Uh, Part of that is down to Andrew, Fran, Stephen and the team. It's about welcoming people in and inviting them to take part in a whole series of opportunities. So we kind of set about kind of working through um, the feasibility study and kind of understanding what the main challenges were. Well, the main challenge was heating. Doesn't sound particularly glamorous in kind of architectural um, terms, but fundamentally, in, in <laughs> and the floor, um, it was about understanding how we went through a process of heating this building. So we worked with um, Mesh Energy, who came up with a fantastic strategy. We've got um, two air source heat pumps um, just down the side of the church here. We managed to get in just before uh, the feed-in tariff disappeared uh, for non-domestic buildings on, on um, the air source heat pumps. Um, but also, um, we've got a, what they, um, many of you may well know is a bivalent boiler. So in the, in the absolute depths of the winter, when the air source heat pumps might be really working quite hard, we are still allowed to kind of put a little bit of fossil fuel into that just to kind of lift this. So as Andrew said, we proposed to take up the existing parquet flooring and put in what is essentially a giant radiator. Um, we took the church off for a day in London to go and visit Lazenby, who laid this floor, and also to go and visit the Garden Museum in Lambeth, which, has got, which, is a, which was a church, it's got a beautiful floor like this. Um, and this was actually wasn't that hard a sell to Portsmouth Diocese. They kind of came on board very quickly. Um, so we took, the, we took the parquet flooring up, we sold it for, for quite a, a good sum of money that went back into the, to the pot. Um, so if we just flick on to the next slide, please, Paul. So one of our first tasks um, was to kind of work with the team here around the space which is just in the corner here, which was um, used for fundamentally kind of, um, it was a children's space, it didn't have the door on the screen there. So it, it was quite a challenge because um, as many of you'll know, you know, Andrew is a very experienced architect and had actually worked in that space himself, he'd designed various pieces. So our challenge was to design something that was sympathetic 
but actually, as Andrew mentioned earlier, was a kind of one-to-one -one, uh, scale opportunity to actually attempt something before we got into the bigger project. So we went through a whole series of different sketch iterations, looking at how we might achieve that. And then if we just flick onto the next slide, we then kind of proposed this uh, plywood screen and door, um, which was fantastic, really, because um, the birch ply lends itself to the, to the interior. You'll see that we haven't really kind of introduced any color. The color is the people that kind of inhabit this space. Um, so for us, it was about kind of muted uh, palette. So if we just stick on to the next one, please, Paul. And so then we kind of started the project. Now, the, one of the interesting things, we had a whole long discussion about how do we deal with this as a project. Do we deal with it as a main contractor? Is it construction management? And effectively, um, our QS, uh, Peter Grant, who I've known for uh, a number of years, who's a very experienced QS and contractor, um, we threw the challenge to him to become our project manager. And actually, it took us a little bit of negotiation with Portsmouth Diocese around, you know, how, how do we deliver this without a, a main contractor? But we basically packaged up every element, you know, the floor, the joinery, uh, the mechanical and electrical. And once we've got over those hurdles, we then started the project. I think we were probably just going into the pandemic when we started the project. Yeah. So in some ways, that was quite fortunate in that we were able to kind of mothball the community and the church um, and actually start the project. So you'll see in those images there, you can see Fran on the, on the uh, top right, who's um, mulling over uh, the first pour of the polished concrete by Lazenby. And, and on day one, all the Kiwis that were pouring this floor uh, rushed into the building and said, um, you best come out and have a look, because the pump exploded in the road there, and we ended up with polished concrete and oil all over the road. But the guys that laid it were absolutely incredible. They, they kind of mopped it all up and said, we'll be back next week to finish the, finish the pour. Um, and, and you'll see that the parquet flooring there was, was a beautiful parquet flooring, but it wasn't doing a great deal in terms of actually enabling us to heat this building. Um, but one of the sort of happy accidents of this floor is that the floor has actually changed uh, the kind of lighting in this building. We get fantastic lights sort of bouncing around in here. Um, and then we were then kind of quite fortunate in that by delivering you know, what we were, we sort of came out of the pandemic and we were able to kind of reopen this building. So last, last slide, I don't know how long that is. And so um, more recently, um, we have been sharing the project um, with um, various architectural magazines and various awards. We've just um, come off the back of being commended in the RBA Journal uh, McEwen Award. Um, three weeks ago, it won the uh, AJ Small Project Sustainability Award. Those are not the reasons that we did this, but um, I think that's kind of justification to the team here, the community who've worked so hard through not just the pandemic, but actually giving rebirth to this building and, and rebirth to this community. We feel immense honor and pride that we were given an opportunity to work with Andrew and the team here. And um, I'm just going to leave you with the, the final quote by Ai Weiwei um, at the bottom there which says, if you help one person, you have the opportunity to help humanity. So, um, any questions? Brilliant, thank you. Any questions? So, I'll pass the mic around. Come on, someone's going to have a question. Okay, well, if there's no, if there's no questions, I'll ask a question at the back. Yes, I agree. Um, we haven't really got any plans to remove any more bits. Um, we, we, we spoke that the Archdeacon is a, is a kind of custodian of the, uh, the, the, the church buildings in the, uh, in the city or in any diocese, in this particular diocese. So any um, elements that need to be removed or we want to remove or we want to change or adapt have to go through them and then of course go through the uh, the DAC, which you've been the Diocesan Advisory Committee, which is kind of like, the, for those of you who don't know, it's kind of like the church's version of the Planning, planning uh, Committee. 
Um, no, the Darcys have been super, super supportive of everything that we've, uh, that we've wanted to do. And you'll notice that most of the stuff, I think actually all the, all the things, with the exception of the floor, clearly, uh, are removable. So if somebody did want to you know, take it all away, they could do. Um, we've got no plans to do that. And things like the toilets at the back uh, are in the 1950s bit anyway. Um, so, yeah. I think the only major question we got was around how we were going to heat the building. And, and so when Mesh did their feasibility study to kind of look at what the, you know, the proposal would be for the heating, the diocese just wanted to be absolutely sure that we were going to be able to heat this building through a renewable heat source. So that's why um, you know, Mesh did a really good piece of detailed work to kind of prove that actually you know, the air source heat pumps, yeah, they're great, they're a renewable heat source, but they might need topping up, you know, they might need topping up. Um, uh, you know, we, we've, not, we've not kind of looked at the overall fabric, so you'll see that, you know, some of the windows are still boarded up because they're a structural health and safety hazard risk. Um, we've not upgraded the uh, roof at the moment. Um, so this, this was about kind of a finding an approach that would heat this space up to a particular level so that you know the church could do whatever they wanted um, I mean the only major question we got into with the archdeacon was the tone of the floor and I remember at the opening last summer um, for some reason I was sat made to sit next to the archdeacon and her first question to me was Darren I'm not absolutely sure we picked exactly the right tone and I went very quiet, and she nudged me and said, at that point, you're supposed to tell me that I made the right decision. So, so that was the only, you know, the heating and the, and the tone of the, of the concrete. Um, Actually, I mean, we haven't got, we haven't got any uh, kind of, like, measured data, but certainly over the, over the winter, though this winter hasn't been particularly cold, it's been really comfortable in here com from being absolutely freezing to the point where we... I hate it when people wear coats in churches, get cut off <laughs> so, <you> know, <laughs> we haven't got the heating on at the moment uh, because it just you know you just don't feel welcome if you, you don't go to the house and leave your coat on do you so we have piles of blankets at the end of the chairs and people wrapped up in things like that. and we have those um you, you, you i was being a little bit coy earlier about actually being an architect but i'm an architect um the um you know there's kind of gas heater things that you have to when, it, when it's desperate to dry a building out and you know it's going to ruin all the joinery but the client's screaming for it so you get those things we had two of those which made the most terrific noise so we had them on as long as we dared and switched them off when somebody wanted to say something like we were singing or whatever or we were having a you know uh, the message and then bang on they would go again um yeah but actually it's been fine and the so this was finished during the lockdown and just just for the sort of context so we carried on, we had live services on, you know, broadcast over YouTube or Facebook or something. Um, and when we couldn't even meet together, we had to splice, I'm saying we, it was Paul, had to splice the things together. So you'd have somebody, you know, reading the scripture, somebody doing the links, and it would often be me doing, me doing the links. So I'd sort of say, thank you, Paul. You know, <laughs> Paul was like three miles away. Uh, but anyway, eventually we were allowed for six people to meet together, as you recall, so we could do that in here, so we could have a live service, but with no congregation. And it was in the kind of middle of winter, and you came in and you think, oh, something feels slightly odd. You take your shoes off, and oh, wow, the floor's warm. And so we're basically just lying on the floor. Oh, it's so lovely. But it works. It works really, really well. You kind of know the numbers. It's like the numbers, isn't it? The numbers are great, but actually when you experience it, it I've never felt like I've needed to have my coat on over the, over the winter. Like I say, I know it's not been that cold, but um, but yeah, it's, it's it's brilliant. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and he did make the right choice of the colour, by the way. Now, um, yeah, I, I think what's really fascinating is uh, this practical solution has driven a spatial solution, which you know, coming up with a solution of how to heat the building, which is sometimes think something you you consider after you've come up with a kind of a planning solution. You know, a planning solution architecturally. Um, the thing I'm interested in for both of you is is what's come out of this that maybe you hadn't planned in terms of in terms of the experience now. So maybe Andrew and Darren, you know. So Andrew, from your point of view as a client, what 
what unhappy accidents have there been in terms of the use of the space so far? And Darren, w what could you see that, that's come from this? Obviously, working with the community has been really fascinating. Well, what sort of unintended consequences in terms of use or activity that might have come from, from this solution? Yeah, I think that, that's a really great question, Lorraine. I think from the, the happy accident aspect is when you, because um, the building is here, it exists, we, we could move around it. <coughs> but when we started to fit out the bays, just how well those things fitted together, how well they worked, that, that's the perfect place for a cafe. It's not intrusive, it doesn't interrupt with the dignity of, of having a, a service here. And we've had some, you know, some very serious service at Easter Day. Uh, is a beautiful, joyful service. Good Friday is a much more contemplative thing. It doesn't get in the way at all. Um, the, the, that you can pull all the, when, when we have a look around, there's all sorts of bits of bespoke furniture in there that pull out and allow you to make the place look like the community shop, but you can clear it away afterwards. So those, the way those work so well, I think was, um, uh, was one of those very joyful kind of uh, situations. I mean, and, and just what the floor does, to, to the light in here is, I mean, it's, the sun's starting to go now, but it, it is absolutely beautiful. Uh, and this was, that's, that's the kind of architectural part of me saying that, that I knew, I know polished concrete is beautiful. We all know that because we're all architects, lovely material. But when you see it for the first time in a space like this, you go, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I just, like, wow. <laughs> you know, I was, I, even I, for those of you who know me, will know this is something that doesn't have very often, was speechless. Yeah, I, I, think, I think for us, um, I mean, we've, we've learned so much from this project on so many different levels. Um, fundamentally, attending um, Sunday services, Roger and I, you know, just kind of retreating to the back and observing and learning, um, doing the community engagement. We've taken that on to various other projects now, and it's taught us not just about buildings, but actually about public space, because this feels like a bit of piece of public space. Um, and I think, you know, when you've got the elements that kind of retreat into the arches it allows this space to be anything and I'm, I, I remember actually one of our first meetings I can't remember whether it was Fran or somebody else who said I've got this fantastic idea about putting a, a basketball court in this space uh, yeah and and but I think one of the other major things I've learned is to you know when you have a client body that's got a really strong vision is is to actually you know, as an architect, it's, you know, we're renowned for coming on board with an idea. You know, we've got an ego, we've got an idea, there's the idea. And actually one of the major things that we've learned is not to come on board with any preconceived ideas. Learn from, you know, the team, learn from the community, and learn from the experience. Um, because now, <laughs> bizarrely, we're now being put into other potential projects through Portsmouth Diocese where they're saying, do the St. Margaret's thing. And we're saying, actually, no, we're not going to do the St. Margaret's thing because we learned from St. Margaret's of not coming on board with, with the idea. And it's really important to, to step back and, and, and understand what, what's really important from the, from the client's view and how that changes. Because, you know, th this space and this project has changed, you know, o over the time that we've been working on it. Yeah, I mean, fr from, a, from a client's perspective um, and... That's something that certainly the way that we practice in, in, in our practice is to really listen to the, what the clients need, not what they want, but what they need. And, and there are certain things that we, that we could easily have latched onto uh, that, that would have gone away from keeping the thing the thing, as I said at the beginning of the talk. That this is a church. This is here to serve the community and for people to worship Jesus. We're Christians. We're not a shop, we're not a cafe, we're not a, play, a soft play area. We do those things, but we do them with a purpose and with a compassion so that the space still needs to function as a church. You know, it, it, sometimes the seats are like this, sometimes they're in a circle, sometimes there's a baptism font thing, swimming pool there, sometimes there isn't, sometimes there's a band, sometimes there's not. Um, but we, we, I think, learned from being able to listen to the things that Darren and Roger were coming up with, saying, like, Okay, that's a great idea, but is that going to take us away from what our vision is? So, from a client's perspective, we need to have a really strong vision. We're lucky because we've got, you know, we've got a book which is about that thick, which is full of the vision. You know, you just got to read it and understand it. Uh, so that's quite good. So, with other clients that don't have that kind of clear vision, perhaps sometimes that's a bit more complex, and that's 
where, you know, if I put my architect hat on, that's where our role, that's where the architecture is in a lot of projects, isn't it? It's getting in and under the client's skin and really understanding what they need, really, you know, living with them, inverted commas, in that sense. Going, like we do a lot of education work, um, and just really understanding how important the way a door swings sometimes can be to the success or failure of a five million pound project. And that's an actual example, I'm not exaggerating. Um, so yeah, just that, that kind of iterative process of checking and changing things against what our vision is and, and what we can achieve. Um, that's been really successful on, the, on this project. You want to have a go on the um, play uh, zone, don't you? Awesome. More questions. Hello. Just one comment, really. Um, I get the feeling that when there were 10 people in here, um, there were a lot of dark corners that weren't being used. And what you've done now is basically expanded into the building in a, in a most amazing way because you're pointing out various aspects of the various spaces. They're all being used very flexibly. So people have grown into the building and made it all really useful. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, that one lovely thing is the first wedding that we had in here was uh, Frankie and Joel. Uh, so Frankie is um, uh, has a beautiful singing voice, runs the band, Joel's her, her husband. So we had the wedding, which was absolutely lovely. Uh, Joel said, would you mind just um, maybe moving the cake from the back of the church? Yeah, sure, mate. What time do you want me down? Oh, okay. Uh, make, make the cake is what he meant. Assemble the cake. I'm like, okay, this is a wedding cake. I've never done this before. Uh, I'm an architect. I can handle it. No, I can't. Um, so, you know, we had the wedding. It's absolutely wonderful. It's beautiful. The whole church was a couple hundred people in here. It was absolutely lovely. Then we're going to have the reception. So, you know, who tidies the chairs away? Well, the community, everybody does it because we're all invested. So the chairs get rearranged, the tables come out from the cafe and you know, the drinks are served. And, and then there's a bit of a dance afterwards. So where do the band go? Well, they go in the alcoves and they go wherever they want. So the whole thing was just exactly what you're saying. It wasn't confined to here and, you know, we all went over there for the reception. It used every single square inch of space um, to great and joyful effect. They're very happy, by the way. Very lovely. Any more, any more questions? Sorry, that sounded rather school uh, teacherly, didn't it? But any more questions? <laughs> no? Do you want to have a look around? Great, let's have a look around. <laughs> 